right, so we are joined now by Elizabeth Campbell, who's going to be speaking for Proposition um, 1, which is the uh, monorail authority. So go ahead with a, up to five minute introduction. All right, so it's created it's a, for a city transportation authority, and it's created under a specific RCW. And the bar for it is either the city council can create the transportation authority or citizens can. And the process for doing that is citizens can go out and get 1% of the registered voters in the territory that the transportation authority is going to be in. And the RCW was created by the legislature to facilitate the last uh, go around that they did with the monorail. So originally there was a, a version of the transportation authority created and then I'm sure you remember it went through a couple different votes and so then the legislature saw that they wanted to enable that process to continue on so they created this RCW. And so even though people talk about, well, this is about a monorail, but it's actually a lot of it's about a transportation authority and what that authority can do. And it creates a, a authority that has taxing powers, it has the powers of eminent domain, it can plan and construct a transportation system. And where the monorail comes in is that that's the technology that would transport people. So, you know, that's kind of an interesting feature that tends to get latched onto, but I think the more important part is, is that it's an opportunity for citizens to engage in meaningful transportation planning. They're not going to have to go through their elected officials per se, except for when it came time to get any permitting or something like that. This is an opportunity for citizens to have their own transportation uh, agency that they can participate in, they can be on the board, and then there's quite a bit of opportunity for different constituencies. And that is actually written into the legislation that this petition would make law. So that's one of the things that I'd like to really emphasize, that it's not so much it's about the monorail and didn't we do the monorail and all that, it's about, well, what are city, the city of Seattle's transportation needs? Is there an opportunity for an organization that's dedicated to, to planning and uh, constructing a uh, transportation system? And I think that's something that you know, should stand out in people's minds a little bit more. Great, thank you. So now we'll open up to follow-up questions. These are two-minute answers. I'll start with the first one. So I think um, one of the first general critiques is, um, oh, well, we already have so many different layers of, of transportation. We've got Sound Transit, we've got County Metro, the City of Seattle does its own stuff. Um, the State of Washington runs highways. Um, so, uh, what is the benefit of adding another layer of, not necessarily bureaucracy, but a different authority of any type uh, in order to fund transit? Why can't we go through sound transit with the metro? Well, I think I would answer that in a certain way and say, well, how are those agencies serving you? Wash dot the state level, it has the tunnel project, for example, or even the 405 highway or the 520 going across the bridge, uh, Lake Washington. So I say, well, how are they working out for you? How is King County Metro working out for you? How is Sound Transit working out for you? Sound Transit started in 1996, it failed, and then it went on, changed the terms and conditions of the system that it promised, and today it's vacuums out of the area economy between five and six hundred thousand dollars a year and what do we get for that metro is uh, operating in a deficit it just recently went through a process where it's cutting services so it seems like between the two there's a certain degree of mismanagement s dot well, what does it bring to the table it spends a huge amount of money planning projects and it delivers very little. Right now, of course, it's focusing on the Seattle streetcar. And yet, there is no um, 
capacity for that Seattle streetcar to transcend the congestion in the city. And that's where you come into the kind of high capacity transportation that I'm talking about in this uh, petition. So I kind of think that, you know, on balance, this is an opportunity to have something that's literally dedicated to solving a problem in the city of Seattle. It will make the connections to sound transit, to metro, to all the assorted elements that these disparate entities are putting together, but I think it's time that, you know, another player comes in and that it's a citizen-based player. Questions? Yeah. Just very quickly, what's the RCW limits? Well, I shouldn't know if I remember, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, is it the same one that the old, I mean, it was actually turned Monorail, Monorail Authority was under prior? Yes. Okay. Are there, are there same? I think it's 35.9A or something like that. I mean, are, I, are there other, um, transportation districts like this one else, elsewhere in the state? No, because the RCW provides that it's a city of 500,000 or more. Well, so it's Seattle. Kind of, oh, right, right. Yeah, kind so of, it's not a first class city, it's yeah. Okay, so I imagine this RCW was created for the monorail back in the day, so now yes. it's okay. But it's remained on the books. I mean, the legislature hasn't you know, taken it off the books. And if you look through it, it actually provides for a multiple of opportunities, um, not just, you know, the system itself, but it actually allows that that transportation authority can go out and do take, take on projects that can add to that system. So it could promote uh, transit-oriented development or it could it promote uh, some type of uh, civic center of some kind, as long as those things feed the system and create more opportunities for uh, users, the authority has actually quite broad powers. Another feature that's in this particular uh, petition is it's an, there's a pool of money that's set aside for citizens, groups, or individuals that want to participate in some of the planning. Say, a lot of times, say you're doing EIS, environmental review, and you want to have your own study about something, you're like, well, did they consider the implications of, you know, some environmental issue? They could apply to this pool of funds and actually have money to go out and hire an expert to help, you know, vet that particular issue. So it was set up to be pretty citizen friendly, kind of unlike some of the processes that we engage in now. I don't have the opportunity if I go to an EIS that the city of Seattle is producing. Unless I'm independently wealthy, there's no opportunity for me or my constituency to hire experts or give some kind of a study or something like that. Other questions? So, um, the actual ballot measure would uh, levy some taxes off the tax, correct? Yes, it's a, five, it's a flat $5 fee on the license renewal. There's about 400 and, I think it's about 409,000 cars that it would be uh, levied on, so it raises approximately $2 million per year. One thing we did is there was a controversy in the last go-round where the Department of Labor had not, uh, or Department of Licensing, had not really determined what the tax was applicable to, what vehicles. So this time we told them, we're not doing that again. You will be asked this anyway. So would you go through and, just, and make a custom study of how this tax would be applied? So that's why we know that that's literally what it would raise and how many cars there are approximately that it would be a levy against. So the $2 million, that would fund, I guess it would just fund the entity and the board and, the, right. and any actual infrastructure would require additional Another vote. And you said that the, uh, the authority uh, would have the uh, power to uh, you know, raise revenue, levy taxes. Would it have to go back to the people for any type of tax that it would bring as sort of revenue? 
Yes, for each of its taxes or even for issuing, issuing the revenue bonds, which obviously you need a system to get revenue. But yeah, every time it goes back to the voters for approval. So this isn't to build it. And a lot of people think about the things that we've offered on the website or promoted in our um, releases. All of the routing and you know the different alignments and everything, that's all suggested to people. Because there's going to be an opportunity for people to weigh in and to you know, say, well, I think it should go here, I think we should have more or less, or how many stations. And the other interesting feature about this happening at this point is Sound Transit and ESTA actually just got through studying this corridor. And everything that we're offering here in terms of the alignment, in terms of the system, in terms of it being great separated, in terms of even some of the station locations, that's exactly the things that they just studied. And they absolutely um, confirm what it is that we're putting before the voters at this time. So here's an opportunity to get a jump start on things and really make this happen. Sound Transit, it, when it talks about, well, we might do this sometime, they're talking about, well, it'd be somewhere in 2026 that that connection between Ballard and downtown and West Seattle would be made. So, personally, I'm getting older, and so are a lot of the people in my age group, and I don't want to wait until 20, in 2026. That just seems insane to keep waiting like this. Do you have any idea of how much it would cost to actually build one? Well, we've looked at other systems around the world. So since the last go-round with the monorail pier, this is an interesting feature that distinguishes the time now between the time in the past, is that there's been between, uh, depending on what kind of size you want to look at, but there have been four to five major monorail systems built since that time. And based on the construction costs for those, and that's been in Mumbai, India, there's one in Sao Paulo, in uh, Brazil, there's one in um, the Middle East, there's our sister city in China, they have uh, something like a 13 mile long uh, monorail system. We're figuring that for the up to 17 miles that we're proposing, that it would be between two to two and a half billion. And also, one thing to remember is we can also phase this. We're not saying, oh, we got to build it all right in one fell swoop. It may be that it's good to do it between Ballard and downtown or West Seattle and downtown. I mean, there's a lot of flexibility, really, that's in this. And again, this is just the opportunity for the citizens to come in, form their agency that's dedicated to establishing a transportation system on the west side of Seattle. I mean, there's nothing in the near future, whether it's streetcar, whether it's, you know, even the rapid ride bus thing. There's just nothing in the near future if you're looking at SDOT or WashDOT or um, Sound Transit to provide those. So, um, what organizations or individuals are getting behind this movement and this initiative? Like, who's, who's supportive of creating this transit authority? Well, we're just about ready to announce some of the support. Obviously, you know, this has been a citizen grassroots effort, but we actually have, um, I think it's four different labor uh, unions that are getting ready to come on board. Two of them will take, um, or two board positions on the inner board will actually be comprised of individuals from labor. So that's kind of our main uh, support level that we're going to, and then we're also kind of expanding out now to see what elected officials might want to, you know, be involved and endorse us. And it's kind of a work in progress, but you know, I think labor was a major um, acquisition for us to get in terms of support. So with the board, I understand that you have uh, several. Positions and some are reserved, like labor and other different categories.
categories, if you will. Yeah. Like who, who is the appointing authority, or who chooses who is on the board? The board, in most respects, is self-sustaining. The legislation sets out the nominating uh, entities. So, say, like, um, when you come to that first permanent authority board, you would have, say, like the University of Washington. This is set out specifically. So the University of Washington, the Economics Department, and the Evans School of Public Affairs. Um, another entity is the Manufacturing Industrial Council. Another one is Sierra Club. Another one is, um, you know, I'm missing somebody, Downtown Association Chamber of Commerce. If one of those opts out, then there's a process written in the legislation for another entity to come in and say it's uh, something to do with, uh, say, immigrate, immigrant rights or something like that. They could come in and become a nom nominating entity. But they have to, any nominating entity has to show a record of being involved in Seattle uh, issues, have a demonstrated record of accomplishing certain things in Seattle, um, but it's all set out in the legislation. That I wanted to try, you know, when we went through this, to make sure that there was a good, not necessarily just grassroots, but a really populist kind of a makeup to the board that I didn't want to have it be like, oh, you know, a career politician or something like that. And the trouble with the last board makeup was there was people that were actually running and going, well, we're going to get on the board so that we can, you know, terminate the monorail project. And that was a concern that we had, that we didn't want people to come in and try to, you know, be a wrecker kind of a thing. So is the legislation specific enough that it says this seat shall be someone chosen by the Sierra Club? Because I know, I know a lot of boards and commissions that will say this seat is reserved for someone with background in the environment, or this seat is, is um, for uh, an MD or other medical professional, but chosen by the mayor with, you know, you know consent of the council. So is this, is there any, um, is, I guess, is, is the board uh, allowing or rejecting people who, uh, like if the Sierra Club were to split into two different organizations, is there some sort of referee to decide who gets to choose the person for that seat? Well, the, the legislation, like in, the, in each of the entities that are chosen, they go through their own kind of internal nominating process. So if they have a membership, or if they have a faculty committee, or if they have a board of some kind, they come up with who the nominees are that they want to present to the board itself. And so that's how that people come to the board itself. It's somebody that's nominated through each of those respective organizations' systems. Then if some new player came in, they're still governed by the same thing. They go through that same nominating process, and it specifically says that their membership or somebody that's, you know, maybe not a faculty member, but somebody within the administration or even students at the university, that they can have a part in that process. It's not meant to be insular, that, oh, the chancellor of the university gets to pick, and then off they go. Um, the other part where it's more specific is in the advisory committee. So there's a 21 member advisory committee, and that's where it's a little bit less specific. So it's not naming an institution, it's saying a uh, cause issue driven, or a, um, like so there's seats reserved for tribal representatives, there's seats reserved for people that are active with disabilities, or people that are uh, senior citizens. Um, related issues, that, but that 21 member board, that is where it's again trying to bring in a little better representation, I think, than what the last one had. If you look at like Sound Transit, well, it's all run by elected officials, period. There's no opportunity for the public to do anything in that other than to show up at the meeting and say hi. The same with SDOT or the city. That's driven by 
driven by your council members. This is an opportunity for specific uh, players to come in and have a part in managing or influencing or literally running the agency. Time for one more question. So one issue with the parks district was I was creating a new entity and it, it you know, can't be destroyed, it's a zombie organization or whatever. Um, if this transit authority were created in November, could it be destroyed? <laughs> For lack of a better could word. Be, I mean, could you undo, could you yes. get rid of it? It's not like the parks district. And again, you know, so I would note a couple things. So the park district is a version of the transportation authority. You could go back and say, well, why does the city of Seattle need a parks district? It already has a parks department. But if you look at it from the standpoint of the transportation authority, again, we have an agency that's just dedicated to doing one particular thing, parks. Unlike the parks district, though, the transportation authority has somebody other than, you know, elected officials just placing themselves in power and there's no opportunity for anybody else to come in there. And so I think the Transportation Authority provides a much more broad base and I would think over time that the members, the members that are on the board that they change, there's a limit on terms, they can't just stay there forever. And so I think it has a better governance system than what the Parks District has in store for it. Great, so we're about out of time if you want to take 30 seconds for closing comments. Well, I just encourage people, I actually encourage people to read the petition itself. It's quite lengthy, but I think that on balance, I would hope that when people read it, that they would see that it's a real opportunity for citizens. And it's an opportunity for the committee, the community to be represented. And then in the final analysis, it's an opportunity to really go ahead and set in place a system, a transportation system on the west side of Seattle, this high capacity, grade separated. And I have had trepidations about using this slogan from the past. Uh, effort, but it really sums it up. It's an opportunity to rise above it all. So <laughs> <laughs> that's what I think you know it has to offer the public. And I'm personally looking forward to a ride on it. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs>